Welcome, George. Welcome, George Mann, to the interview show with PVC, the People's Voice Cafe, which I called PVC NYC TV, for lack of a better brand. <laughs> so, a lot, you of, for, a lot of uh, letters in it. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Alliteration and letters. Yeah, that sort of thing. So thank you for joining us. And you have a show upcoming on November 11th uh, at the People's Voice Cafe with Rick Pallieri. And I'm very excited to get the chance to hear you and to know more about you today. Uh, I will freely confess, I don't know a lot about your music and your background. And I'm sure that members of our audience are in the same boat. So we're going to talk today about you and get to know you better. And then, of course, we'll get to know your music better as well uh, in November. So let's start with the easy one. Uh, you know, where were you born? Where were you raised? How did you get started in music? What was your passion when you were a young person? Well, thank you, Chris. First off, uh, I lived in New York City for many years, so, so I'm looking forward to seeing some old friends when I get back. But I've been in Ithaca for 13 years now since I left New York City in 2010. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of good people from the PBC um, and at the PBC. Uh, I lived in New uh, Long Island growing up. I was a, a you know soccer player and uh, a journalist and thought that was going to be my life. But I started playing guitar when I was 10 years old and always loved music. And I was playing in bands by the time I was a teenager. And uh, that went out over soccer in my senior year. And, uh, and I just kept playing in rock bands. And I was starting to write songs as a teenager. But it wasn't until years later... When I became a union representative, a union organizer, actually, for the Musicians Union, um, ultimately that I learned a lot more about folk music and started becoming more of a folk musician probably 25 years ago. It's now 25 years since I released my first album with Julius Margolin, who was a legend in the labor movement in New York City, a lovely guy who died at 93 years old in 2009. And we had a 10-year partnership and had a wonderful time making music and, and all the songs against George Bush, the Hail to the Thief CD series we produced, four albums that featured everybody from Tom Paxson and Utah Phillips to Ann Feeney and uh, Magpie and great friends like that, you know, just all wonderful people. Um, so uh, I've been doing a lot of work over the years in music, but for a long time I was a union organizer. And it was about 13 years ago, 14 years ago now that I finally made the jump to music full time. And part of that left involved leaving New York City where the cost was too high for me to live as a full time musician. If I, if I live without a regular paycheck. Sure, and I sure. To Ithaca. And uh, these days, my day job is singing for nursing and veterans homes and I'm not on tour. I'm out maybe about two months a year and just rebuilding touring after COVID, of course, for the last few years. It was very hard to do any touring, but I'm on my way to Australia for a four-week tour starting October 12th or 13th, my first date. And then I'll come back just literally three or four days before I see you all at uh, PVC, assuming my plane doesn't get stuck. Yeah. I'll be there on the 11th. <laughs> but uh, I'll probably have a little bit of an Australian accent. <laughs> but, uh, but I'll be hey, back there. us musicians, we pick up those those sounds, you know. So if you start talking about bodies, then we know we know we know you've been there. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> I try to disguise the fact that I'm not an Aussie a little bit. No, no, of course not. I'm joking. And one of the great things about um, – touring Australia and I've been there and this will be my 14th trip there 14th wow. tour there, uh started in 2010 or 11 the first time I toured there was that um they, they're very welcoming to American folk musicians uh especially with with the political bent that I have because um they all a lot of people overseas imagine we're very much like Donald Trump and his supporters you know or if not that a political at best and so when they hear about people uh, and hear about the songs of working people and the struggles of working people that we are involved in through our songs. Uh, I think that helps uh, reassure them that we're not all the same over here in the United States. Well, I think I think that's a very important point that that we should we should emphasize here. I know that my mother did a lot of traveling uh, during her lifetime, and she traveled by herself a lot too. And she constantly was amazed at the fact 
that people in other countries just assumed that all Americans were of one ilk politically and not one that, that they liked. And so along comes my mother, who's the equivalent of a red diaper baby for all essential purposes, you know, and she's talking, you know, radical. She's talking left and people are like, oh, my God, the, you, you exist. <laughs> you know? And so it's, it's, it, it's reassuring to them. But it's also important for us to realize that the bad things that happen here, they reflect on all of us elsewhere. And that, that's oh, a yeah. big deal. Well, and even my friends in Canada and Australia, especially Australia, where I was touring after Trump, one, because remember, he lost by three and a half million votes to Hillary in 2016. It's just the Electoral College that acted him. Was I had to keep reminding people, they'd say, what's wrong with the American people? And I'd say the American people didn't elect Donald Trump. He lost by three and a half million votes. We have a system that allows the loser to win. That's corrupt. And it's, uh, you know, has now chosen the loser in what, twice in the last 20 years, right? Uh, so, um, so yeah, that was reassuring to them to know. And of course, you know, the, the music that came out of the Bush years and certainly the wars, um, and even the, the protest music against Trump that is still coming out is vital. And it's good to hear, um, friends making songs, uh, still making songs that are, are in that vein. Yep, absolutely. And uh, I'm glad to hear that you have this long history. So tell us more about, you know, when you said you grew up in Long Island, you started doing the band music, you realized you, you were a musician at your core, and that's where you were going to go. Where did you end up going to college? And what, what was your first job when you, when you finished college that allowed you to do more music? Well, uh, I was a journalist. Uh, I edited my college paper at SUNY Stony Brook. I got my degree in 1986 and got thrust into the middle of a years-long battle for union representation among the State University of New York graduate teaching assistants, uh, 3,000 of us. And I was an organizer. That was my first job as a union organizer. I was the editor of the newsletter for a few years. Um, yeah, as I said, I thought I was going to be a journalist. And, you know, that's something I just really have honed in recently on how many songwriters are journalists, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you talk about Woody Guthrie, and he's a journalist in his writing because he documents what's going on. But uh, Phil Oaks had been a journalist, right? I mean, Jimmy Buffett, I just read in his obituary, he had been a, a, a music reviewer for Billboard before he ever made his first record. So I was a journalist, serious one. I wrote for the New York Times for a year as a, a freelancer for the Long Island. Uh, New York Times section and I wrote for Newsday for a year. Uh, my mentor was the managing editor of Newsday and I thought I was going to go into work as a journalist but uh, music was still pulling at me and this struggle for graduate student employees it was a seven year battle to get the right to even vote for the 3,000 teaching assistants in SUNY and I was part of that struggle in 1986-87 right up until 1992 when we finally won the court ruling that said the 3,000 teaching assistants could have a union if they won it and we won with 85 percent of the vote uh, and, and then from there I went into the musicians union and I worked for local 802 in New York City big bad local 802 the biggest union of musicians in the world uh, local and we had a lot of power 25 30 years ago and we still do um, but uh, I, I couldn't do what I wanted to do, really. I couldn't make music while I was working for the union. I wasn't allowed to as an oh, organ. Really? Oh, I wasn't allowed to produce commercial music and sell mm -hmm. or perform. My, my performing was limited to uh, strike uh, picket lines, benefits, and, and things that were approved by the union because I was a full-time organizer for the union. Right. We organized a new school jazz faculty in those years. Uh, the adjuncts, they, they wanted a union, and I was the lead organizer in 1997. Now, a year later, the UAW organized the rest of the teaching assistant, uh, the um, adjunct professors in the new school. So we started things. We, we we built the Justice for Jazz campaign when I was there, which was to bring as many of the jazz leaders under union contracts so that their players would get benefits. We were holding death burial benefits for some of the masters of jazz who couldn't afford to be buried because they had no pension and no health insurance at the end of their lives. So we changed lives in that way. And I, I was an organizer for the communication workers and even for SEIU for a while. Um, but again, I finally went full-time into music about 12, 13 years ago when I left New York City, even though I've been making music for years. And along the way, I met Julius Marklin. I sang in the New York City Labor Choir, New York City Labor Chorus for 10 years. Um, I'm hoping I'll see some of them on November 11th. Uh, some of them are still kicking and out there, and I see them at the labor festivals, you know. And, um, and then we started making the protest songs with Julius, 
when Bush was elected or when he was elected, quote unquote, he stole Florida with his brother's help, the governor of Florida. And uh, we made the first album in 2001, Hail to the Thief. And that album had only a few people on it. Chris Chandler and Ann Feeney was on it. Uh, the San Francisco Labor Choir, John Fromer and, and I think uh, Francisco Herrera out of San Francisco had a song on it. And um, 9-11 happened like a month after we released that album. So you couldn't put out protest music in the wake of that. We waited till the summer of 2002 and then we started promoting that. And uh, interest in, in Bush protesting Bush was growing by then because the war was already going bad in Afghanistan and we knew Iraq was coming and there's going to be deaths in the, in the thousands and the movement to stop the war in Iraq that culminated in spring of or March of 2003 before he invaded the, the country was amazing movement. And so we kept making protest songs against Bush for the rest of those Every two years, we put out another album. By the second album, we had people like Tom Paxson and Utah Phillips on board. And other people came on board, like Magpie. Joe Jenks had songs on it. Uh, just some great artists, you know, real, real great. Jim Page was on one of them. You know, just all people who were, Ann Feeney was on three or four of them. God rest her her soul, right? She passed the COVID a couple years ago. Good friend. And so we had a great time. I lived in New York City for a long time. I tried to make a living as a folk singer and realized I couldn't. And it wasn't until I got some really great advice from Utah Phillips, of all people, uh, not of all people. He's, he gave a lot of good advice to good people in, in his time. And and I learned uh, that I had to basically move out of the city and start dedicating myself more to the work um, and and clear the other things from my mind. Problem was, how do you make a living doing that? And sure. it took me three years to figure that out. And part of that was playing to my strengths, which Utah said I had, uh, was that I was an outgoing performer. I knew a lot about the history of this music. I know, you know, I researched the songs and where they come from and the struggles that they came out of. And so um, I built up a business of playing. I still sing for about 30 different nursing and veterans homes upstate New York when I'm not on the road. I even incorporated some of that into my touring in Australia and the West Coast. And, um, you know, it's easy money. You play the hits. You know, I know about 200 songs from everything from Elvis and Hank and Johnny and Roy Rogers to the Beatles and Pink Floyd, you know. <laughs> and, you know, you go all in between. And, you can, and I can wait, 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 wait. No Taylor Swift? Just kidding. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I haven't gotten that far. Tom Petty is about as far as, as, far <laughs> as I go in terms of new songs. But but I also like to do songs by some of my favorite songwriters, you know, and I, I, I do some Cy Con songs and Utah Phillips songs for sure, even on my new record that's coming out. I covered one from each of Cy, uh, his Aragon Mill song, and, and Utah Phillips' Goodnight Loving Trail. Um, both have been mentors and, and inspirations to me. Uh, for the way they live their lives and the way they um, the way they create their art and, and are able to own their art. You know, I'm like one of the so many hundreds of people out there. I'm, you know, I, I'm at a level there. I can make a living, but I'll never make a killing, as Utah said. You know, I'll never fill a thousand seat auditorium, you know. Yeah, I, I think most of us are in that People category. at a concert in Australia, unless it's a festival gig. But the folk world is, as you know, shrinking. And, you know, it's it's hard because... I was just at a concert last night and there was nobody in the audience younger than me in the audience. And I'm not 30 anymore, you know, and that's sad because, um, you know, it's just not appealing or it's not reaching the young people. And these songs mean so much to so many of us, right. Who grew up on them, who've heard them in tense situations and struggles for justice and, you know, struggles for workers' rights for against racism and against sexism, against violence and gun violence. And, um, those songs stick in our memories because they, they, they hit a chord in here and they're not hitting the same way for younger people. And I don't know. Yeah, why. I think I think we're seeing I, I think folk music is not dead. I just think it is evolving for this these younger generations in a more personal form. And so a lot of the anxiety and, and issues that that we are going through today get translated into very personal struggles for the young people. And that's where I'm hearing songs expressing, not necessarily in as innovative ways as, as some of the older ones, but, but I'm hearing the expressions from the lyrical and content standpoint. Uh, and, and I think that also hip hop is the other place where things are being expressed in a very different way that we're used to, but the issues are still being expressed. It's just whether or not 
it's got that same, <clears throat> excuse me, enduring quality and long, potential longevity as the songs that we, we are familiar with because they've lasted for 80 years, some of these songs, if not 100, some of these songs. It's pretty impressive. So let me ask you this. In terms of your songwriting, what is your process? Do you start with, you know, you're a guitarist. Do you start with a couple of chords and something hits you? Or do you start with a concept and you consciously are going to achieve something specific with the song? Is it all of the above? So uh, what, what, is your, what is your process? Well, that's a good question because um, I had the most prolific period of my life over the last few years because of the coronavirus. Um, I was working on the album that was became the coronavirus sessions it's called in 2020 when the studio had to shut down in march of 2020 we had seven songs in process and uh we just started recording with the, my wonderful musicians that i use up here in ithaca and uh for four months the studio was shut down and i was going nowhere all my gigs were canceled everything was shut down in the nursing homes so uh, I wrote four more songs for the album and uh, ended up with a real nice album. And then, of course, we put the record out and nothing changed. My tour to Australia got canceled in, in the fall of 2020. And I knew I wasn't going anywhere else over the winter with the COVID. So uh, I kept writing. And and it was amazing to me that I was coming up with this many songs. You know, I put out two albums in two years and then I took a break. And for this new album, I wrote only five or six new songs for it, you know, wrote, uh, recorded one or two old ones and recorded a few covers. And that engine, Chris, to get the engine going, it seems to get harder and harder. I don't know if it's an age thing or it's just because my own personal feelings about is there any value in writing any more songs i've written i've got seven albums eight albums out in the last 15 years or whatever i mean you know, i've got you know 20 albums i've produced uh including the work with julius and the compilations has it changed the world at all no has it made some people feel better sure have i gained a lot of new friends from my music yes but why do we write songs well, for me, I only write a song when I really get moved to write one. And sometimes I go months without even trying. And, and like I said, I went about a year after the World Like This album came out in October 2021. I didn't write another song for about a year um, or even try seriously to, you know. And um, when that process starts, you got to make room for it. Um, again, it's another thing I've learned is don't try to write a song unless you've got the day free, you know. Because you leave it and you come back two days later or six hours Absolutely. later. Absolutely. It's not the same song and it doesn't, you don't have the same fire. And um, so I can tell you that just about every song I've written in the last 15 years or so is usually a one sitting song. I can walk away three, four, six hours later and I know I've got a recording of it. I've got the lyrics down and most of the feel of the arrangement is what it's going to be. Now that doesn't translate into what it's going to sound like in the studio because I'm just one guitar player. I might throw a little drum beat on it. Right, I might right. come up with a harmonic part but i use bass drums piano keyboard players on my records and you know my records end up being about half acoustic and half with the full band even though it's in the folk americana vein you know uh, genres um singer songwriter too but um but boy it's so that magic of writing songs is just something i still don't never try to explain to people if you've experienced it you know what i'm talking about if you've written something that people say is good and you've seen evidence of that by being on the radio Video or whatever i mean it's just amazing you know i got this new album coming out and it'll be out by the time of course you know it's coming out this week october 3rd and what's but the name what's the name of the album the new record's called this chain and the djs are playing already you know i'm getting the you know the reports from the folk radio the one song is getting more play than any other is a song called the legendary lot 13 and that's a song i wrote 25 30 years ago wow. and I never recorded but it's got incredible fiddle and it bounces and swings so this is what i think we were talking starting to talk about a little bit uh, earlier is that the audience is changing and what we define as folk music or at least white folk singers like me guys defined as a guy playing a guitar and a harmonica or a gal playing a, a guitar and a harmonica and singing a song about something that happened a hundred years ago uh that nobody remembers <laughs> um 
the beat and the danceability of music is is um what you're seeing more and especially in the festivals and the folk groups that are getting out there you know they're bringing more of that lively danceable stuff so uh, as i said i've got a lot of nice quiet folk songs on the new album but the one that so far is getting the most play is a, a bouncy fiddle tune that's like country western bluegrass uh called the legendary lot 13 about an old love song about a, a friend of mine wow that's fascinating so, so, so yeah, so the, the history and and you know the, really when we talk about the core folk music, what to me has always been you know the Woody Pete Odetta, you know Joe Hill, that you know the political folk singing, you know Peter Paul and Mary, you know the one Phil Oaks, um, Bob Dylan to his degree, you know before he stopped singing political songs, you know or stuff, you know being the the folk singer everybody wanted him to be, quote unquote. So that's where I get my um draw my style and my inspiration from, and yet I still of course love the classic rock and roll that so many of us grew up on, you know, in the 60s and 70s. So there's a lot of that in my songwriting, too. And when I write a song, I never know initially or th try to think past getting the song down. What will come later you know, with the band is when we get together and rehearse and I can say, no, I don't like that, or I need you to come in here, or this is where the guitar gets loud, you know, or here's your solo part, you know, make, give me a good solo in this section, you know. Um, it's all about getting the core of the song first and walking away from it, knowing you can sing it the next day, even if you have to still go to the notes for your lyrics until it's up here. I don't know when the next one's coming either. Like I said, I just finished my, a new album, so I'm not even thinking about writing new songs right now. Um, it's all geared about promotion in this next month of touring in Australia and uh, and getting the record out over the next couple months. So generally when that happens, I, I go months without it trying to write again. And I think it's important because some people say it's important to try to write every day or write all the time. And I don't like trying to force a song. I think the song... You know, if it's there, it's going to come to you. And if you open up your your time allotment and your channel to it, uh, then I think it's 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 the best way to write a song. I think that's an interesting point. First of all, I mean, everybody does things slightly differently, but a lot of people, from my experience, take the approach that that you take, which is if you force it, it's going to be forced. It's going to sound forced. I always think of the stories I heard about Paul Simon going to the Brill Building literally three hours every day to work on writing songs. And I said to myself, wow, that's dedication. And he writes great songs. But then I said, well, if I do the math, if he was writing for three hours every day for 40 years, then he should have approximately 5,000 songs of which maybe 200 of which have been recorded. And of the 250 to 60 have been very popular. So probability dictates that even with all that work, if you force the song, it's not necessarily going to be better than the one that you sat down in one day and it hit you. you know? good, po good point. Um, though I would, I would of course, respond and say, we don't know that he wrote a song every one of those days. That's the that, thing. That's Someday true. You end up with the blank slate at the end of the three hours, you know? That's true. But, um, that's absolutely but, true. But, but the other part of that is this, is setting is important, I think, to songwriting. You know, I, I constantly complain about my home setting. You're seeing a little bit of my music room studio, quote unquote, at home. But um, I write better on the road, I find, when I can get the time to write, when you have a break on the road. And there's a song on the new album that I'll certainly be playing November 11th called Tell Me About Woody Again. And it's a story of two boys whose daddy used to sing Woody Guthrie songs to them back in the 60s. And I, I won't tell the whole storyline, but what happened with that song is, I dreamed up the storyline in my head one day and I had the whole storyline from beginning to end, including the sad ending of the song, but I knew I couldn't write it right then. And I knew I was going down to Beluthahatchee, which is a place that Woody Guthrie stayed for months in 1953. It's a Stetson Kennedy, the author. It's an artist retreat near Jacksonville, Florida. And they, they have artist residencies. I was there in 2020, and I've been back a couple of times since for a few days at a time. And I was going to be there. So in my head, it was like, if you try to write this song now, it's not going to be the song you want to write, even though you have the storyline. I waited three weeks and I got there and on the second day I woke up and the end of the day the song was written. And I, was I lucky or was I smart or was it just a combination of both? Uh, you know, it's some, but the song came out and I don't think it would have come out uh, if I tried to write it 
before I got to that space where Woody had walked the grounds and lived for three months in 1953 in a bus uh, when he was uh, doing his rambling through Florida, you know? So, so yeah, so, and I've written, I wrote a song about Utah Phillips and his power of music in California in a teardrop trailer when I was quarantining after the tour uh, from Australia last year. I didn't want to get my friends infected with COVID. And I wasn't sure. So I said, put me up in your teardrop trailer. I got three days before my first gig here. So I'll just stay there and relax. And with a little bit of assistance, uh, uh, green assistance that I generally like when I'm trying to write on the road, um, it, it came out. And it was a song about uh, Utah Phillips and uh, this veteran who loved his songs. And uh, it was a whole storyline about this veteran and the chain he gave me on his deathbed. And that's the title of the new record. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so those are just a couple examples. And, and as I said, you know, there's many times where I've tried to write a song and it hasn't worked out and, or you, you get to a point where, okay, it's not going anywhere. And that one, you know, is never going to make it onto the record. <laughs> you know, I mean, I usually have a couple of songs that are kind of in that stage and they may make the next record or they'll, they'll just, they won't make the record at all, you know? Right, so, I hear you. Now, yeah. you've, you've collaborated with a lot of people. You've played with a lot of people. And um, I'm under the impression that you and Rick Pagliari have done stuff together uh, a lot. Am I, am I incorrect or correct on that? Not a lot, but we did a very special project, which is one thing we'll be highlighting at the concert on November 11th. It's 10 years ago that Rick and I uh, first came up, well, came up with the idea. Rick had the idea for years of honoring the Almanac Singers. Right. The only group that Pete and Seeger and Woody Guthrie ever performed and recorded in together. Right. They they uh, they did this tour in 1941 before World War Two broke out for the U.S. before Pearl Harbor in the spring and summer of 41. They went around the country singing for union halls. And they had just released their seminal record, Talking Union, the six songs that include Pete's Talking Union and The Union Made, songs like that, you know, and uh, Get Thee Behind Me, Satan, all these songs that we all know in the labor movement. And so what happened was Rick wanted to do this project for years and he didn't know how to pull it off. And he talked with Pete Seeger about it and Pete gave him information about the tour. And finally, Rick and I got to be friends and we started talking about doing it. And we made this record that Pete Seeger narrated six months before he died. Uh, it was just amazing. It's called The Almanac Trail, and it's it's available online. We do have copies for sale, but we don't sell. We only have a few copies left from the initial pressing, so we, we it's available for people to download or at our concert. They can buy the hard copy of the CD. What it is is the songs of the Almanac Singers and, and Pete narrating the story of that tour and how they went around the country singing for labor unions. And it was just a wonderful project. It was 10 years ago. So um, at that concert, I mean, well, Rick and I did 26 concerts in 32 days, 9,200 miles from Pittsburgh. We did Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Detroit with Ann Feeney. And then she was recovering from cancer at the time. It was great to have her on the road. And then we continued all the way to California, up to Seattle and back. And uh, in 32 days. So, um, yeah, we, we, it was a really great thing to do that. And to honor Pete and the work he did with Woody and, of course, the labor songs of the Almanac singers. Um, we didn't know he was going to die six or seven months later, but we knew his time was running short. And uh, it was really wonderful that he he got to know that this dream that he and Rick had talked about for many years actually happened. And he, he saw the results of the tour. He heard, got to hear the album before he died, and he was very happy with it. So uh, we're happy about that, too. So, yeah, we'll be singing some of those songs. Which side are you on? I don't want your millions, mister, right? right? Get me behind me, Satan. Going down that road feeling bad. All these great songs that Woody and Pete brought to the people in the 40s. So that actually brings me back to a comment you made earlier where you said, do, song, do our songs change the world? And I guess I have to challenge you and say, if a song is as memorable and as instrumental in motivating people to seek change as the ones you have just mentioned. Isn't it fair to say that those songs change people and people change the world to quote Pete? Yes. And not to contradict, but what I was saying was my doubt as a songwriter and getting the engines going for the new record and the songs I wrote in the last year or so was because I was doubting whether my songs will ever get and not seeing any evidence of my. Now, I know my songs strike people and people come up and say, can you sing me that song? Or I still love that song from 15 years ago that's on this album you made. You know, uh, there's certain songs I know hit people's core, hit people's hearts that people know my music. But as I said, uh, 
back then, first, there were a lot fewer people making music. And there were a lot fewer people making this type of music, right? The the seminal songs of the labor movement, the Joe Hill, Pete Seeger, Woody Guthrie kind of stuff, you know? Uh, and and that's what always struck me. Uh, to me, you know, I, I love folk music and I love the, the elements of it and the community and the sing-along ability of it, all of that. But the fluff of song, you know, when you get to go to a festival, I'm only interested in hearing the songs there. People are singing songs that the lyrics are important, you know, and the lyrics tell stories or the lyrics reach you. And so, you know, I don't sing a lot of love songs or songs about, you know, trivial things. I only write, try to write songs about things that are important in the world or to me, um, or that I think will, will help people in dealing with their struggles. You know, whether it's grief or loss or dejection or just the political situation. So, so yeah. So, and I don't write a lot of funny songs either. You know, that's another thing I've, I've always realized over the years. It's like, you know, a humorous song can go a long way to, to, to bringing the mood up in a concert hall, especially when you're singing a lot of depressing songs about workers and unions and which side are you on, you know? So you gotta, and you learn to do that. You know, you learn to balance your set and, and your, your, your record even with, with, you know, different types and moods. So uh, like with my new record, I mean, there's acoustic stuff, there's bluegrassy, folky country stuff. And then there's singer songwriter, you know, rock and roll songs on that among the album. Those, all those influences are, are part of what I consider my view of folk music you know and I, here you may not be the same as others you know but it's, it's it's what i consider important and why i like highlighting those kinds of songs when i sing again i might do 60 70 percent originals in a concert of mine i usually do at least two or three covers every set you know oh yeah thank god for I'm, covers Oh, yeah. And and I learned that long ago from people like Utah Phillips, you know, and Pete Seeger. It's like, you know, you're not there just to toot your own horn. You're there to remind people of where this music came from and, and who brought it forward over the last hundred years. So, like I said, people like Joe Hill and Pete and Woody and uh, and, and Utah and even Cy Khan now have been singing a lot of his songs and recording his stuff in recent years because they're just so beautiful and powerful songs. Well, I definitely hear you on that. I think the ability to touch somebody's heart through music is a unique gift. And I think that more of us have that gift than we want to give ourselves credit for because we're not nurtured and encouraged to to think that way and to act that way. So we're not as in touch with what we can give to other people. And many more people are musical than we give ourselves credit for. But at the same time, only a few people have the gift of really translating thoughts and feelings into words and music together in a way that that moves us. And uh, you you've done that clearly with with some of your work, and and the other folks that you mentioned have, have clearly done that with their work. And that's that's a great thing. I'm really well, looking forward to hearing this concert. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Well, I, I feel lucky to have been able to to rub shoulders so to speak or elbows with these folks in my life and uh and i said that's one thing when rick and i got together for the project that we will be doing a bunch of songs from on november 11th uh to, to sing these songs together he's a wonderful banjo player and he and i you know i play guitar i'm just a strummer but boy when we get on stage together there's a great energy to it and i realized you know how frustrating it can be and especially for many of the people that we'll be singing to you know we're all struggling to try to you know, get our music out in the world. Some of us know we can't make a living doing it because it's just too hard or the physical limitations or age. You know, I'm starting to slow down, but I've been doing this for 30 years. And if I can do another 10, I'd be real happy, you know, to be able to do that. But, um, you know, but you got to deal with a lot of frustrations and a lot of, a lot of tough times, you know, uh, especially in this world of folk music, because it is contracting. It's not dead, but it is contracting. And, and it's, you know, I, I, I can't imagine that they will have the kind of even opportunities we have now, 20 years from now. Who knows? Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be very different. So let me, let me close out with this question. And I know this is a terrible question to ask, but I have uh, to ask it. Go ahead. Um, and then I will ask you to uh, share your website and other information that you want to share with our audience. But the question is, of all the songs you have written, not of all the songs that you've recorded or performed, but all the songs you've written, is there one that is your personal favorite? No. Are there two that are your personal <laughs> favorites? <laughs> uh, uh, 
if I think about songs that I've written that 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 I think make an impact on people, um, there's a song I wrote 20 years ago called This Beautiful Child, and you can find it on the internet. You can find videos of me singing it live. Um, there's a song I wrote called Cancer Changes Everything. Um, I was thinking about Ann Feeney and John Fromer when I wrote it. They were dear friends of People's Music Network and of mine, um, and they both went through through cancer. I think about a song like Oklahoma Sun, written about Woody Guthrie, which I sing a lot, and I uh, was on an album about five years ago. Um, people really like that song because it tells the story of Woody Guthrie. But um, so you can find any of those songs. You just go to YouTube and Google my name. You'll find hours of me. But um, no, uh, uh, usually the song I'm most in love with is the most recent one I wrote. <laughs> oh, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> and, right. and it's I'm, I'm only. Be, uh, I'm not saying it's the best song, but the last song I wrote for this new album uh, is called "If I Could Turn Back Time." And it's a very quiet, folky song that I just wrote August 17th. Uh, we were in the mixing phase of the record, and uh, we, we knocked it out in a day or two while we were in the last weeks of recording the record, and uh, came out real pretty. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's another song people will be able to find online if I could turn back time from the new album, This Chain. But no, uh, there's no, I don't, you know, I, I look at it, I mean, I'm just as happy, and I, I'm just so filled with emotion singing Utah Phillips songs or Pete Seeger songs in concerts. Some, you know, how can I keep from singing or, uh, you know, all used up, you know, one of my favorites of Utah. All used up is awesome. What what a song. That's such a powerful song. And the story behind that, which he always told about the man he never met, but he imagined this was his story. I don't know if you ever heard the story of that, but Utah has told that story in concert many times about how he came to write that song. So, yeah, so, yeah, I love just any song that moves me, I'm going to sing. And and I don't generally, like I said, now when Rick and I come to the People's Voice Cafe on the 11th, we'll have a set list. But we also have a slot for each of us to do a couple songs in the middle where we don't know what I'm going to do. I'll figure it out that day and I'll sing a couple songs. It's great. It's a lot of fun that way. What is your website and what are your social media links that people should be looking for? Well, I'm not that big on social media. I'm certainly on Facebook, George Mann out of Ithaca. I do have a George Mann music page on Facebook that I hardly ever use. But the real place to find me is on YouTube, George Mann. Of course, on YouTube, you'll find me there. I have a channel. Uh, my website, George Mann, with two N's, music, georgemannmusic.com. Um, and on my own, and on my website, we post plenty of videos for each of the albums. I'm, we're just starting to make videos for the new album. I'm going to post one tomorrow. I don't know how quickly this is going up on, on, on the internet for people to see, but we're running a Kickstarter campaign through the uh, 16th of October to help pay for the mailing of the album. And people can find that on kickstarter.com. But, uh, mainly it's like I said, you know, there's a lot of video and, and, and background on the music on my website, georgemanmusic.com. That's the best place to find me. And you can, you know, email me through there. That's the wonderful thing about websites. They can be the ultimate library, the ultimate repository for all things that have to do with one's work. So I think that's fantastic. Yeah, well, we're in a we're in a stage now where everybody expects to see and hear music for free for the most part, right? Or you can stream it for free if you pay six ninety nine or whatever you pay for the streaming service. So so uh, I'm learning to give people more of a glimpse into that as opposed to just reserving it for those who buy the CD, you know? It helps get you out, and it helps get you gigs. That's another important thing yeah, about absolutely. Well, I want to thank you so much for this time. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, George. I'm really looking forward to the concert on November 11th at the People's Voice Cafe, and I'm looking forward to doing my research and following up on many more of your songs and your performances as well. Thanks a lot, Chris. Looking forward to seeing you and meeting you there. And uh, we'll have a great night. It'll be a Veterans Night, of course, Veterans Day, November 11th. So, yeah, we'll we'll sing a song, a few few songs from the the project Until You Come Home also, which is songs about the effect of war, another compilation I produced with some great artists. So we'll be sharing songs uh, in honor of veterans, too. Well, have a wonderful day and have a wonderful week. All right. Thanks for your time and thanks for doing this. Take care. 